Welcome to another informative episode of the AWS Cloud Practitioner Exam Question Series on Exam Incentive Channel. Please like, share, and subscribe to get regular updates on new episode releases. Let's get started. Episode 19. I will be covering questions 106 to 110 in this episode. For questions 1 to 105, please refer to episodes 1 to 18 of the series. Let's get started. Question number 106. Which AWS service or tool can be used to set up firewall to control traffic going into and coming out of Amazon VPC subnet? Now let's uh, analyze the options. So first one, obviously wrong, is option B. Option B itself is a firewall. It's not a tool or a management console to set up the firewall. So that's wrong. AWS WAF. Then what we have, second one, C. That looks like correct answer, like a firewall manager, but now something like that doesn't exist. So option C is wrong as well. There is nothing like AWS Firewall Manager in AWS. You can go through the services and check for yourself. In terms of then what we have left with is Security Group and Network ACL. Now both are used to control the traffic, but Security Group is used to control the traffic inbound and outbound at the instance level. That's the main difference. Whereas Network ACL, it is used to control the traffic at VPC subnet for both entering and leaving subnet. Between option A and D, the correct option for VPC subnet, which is one of the keywords for controlling traffic uh, going into and coming out of VPC subnet is option D. So security group, we are ruling out because it's at instance level and not at uh, VPC level, whereas network ACL is the right uh, answer for VPC. So the answer for this question is option D. Question 107, a company wants to operate a data warehouse to analyze data without managing the data warehouse infrastructure, which AWS service will meet this requirement. So we need a data warehouse solution. That's the main keyword. And also something that is a managed service. We don't want to manage the infrastructure. If you go through the options. So let's look at the first option, Amazon Aurora. Aurora is a database service. It's not a data warehouse service. There's a difference between database service and data warehouse. Database service is for you know transaction processing, uh, OLTP or otherwise. And data warehouse is required for storing large amount of data where you want to run reports on it. And the storage is important. You want a cost-effective one. And the requirement will be for a data warehouse that you can run large data warehouse related queries for reporting queries on it. So requirements are different. So Amazon Aurora is ruled out. It's a database service, not a data warehouse service. The next one, uh, obviously wrong, AWS Lambda. It's a compute service. It's not a database service. It's nothing to do with a data warehouse. You may run a particular query uh, or a piece of code on a data warehouse solution to get some reports or data set. But uh, in itself, no, it's nothing to do with data warehouse. So that's gone. RDS, again, it's a relational database service. It's not a data warehouse service. It's not optimized to run large scale data warehousing and analytics. So that leaves us with option B. Uh, that's the correct answer for this question. We know Amazon Redshift is a data warehouse service, a serverless version of this data warehouse service, and it is managed uh, service. So that's it uh, on this question. Answer to this question is option B. I think we have seen Amazon Redshift uh, serverless for the first time. So here is a, a piece of documentation from AWS on it. You get insights from data in seconds without having to manage the data warehouse infrastructure because it's a serverless. You don't have to manage the service. Go through the overview of this particular service to understand it better. But uh, from an exam perspective, you just need to know that uh, this is the database service, which is based on Redshift and it's serverless. The question is talking about a serverless data warehouse. Amazon Redshift serverless is your go-to option. Question number 108, how does AWS cloud computing help businesses reduce cost? We need to select two options. All right, so we need to reduce the cost. Now let's look at what options we have. First one, AWS charged the same price for services in every AWS region. No, that's not correct. The pricing for different regions is different and it all depends on the economy of the country. For example, pricing for a US region must be much more costlier than say India region because the economy, the cost of living and cost of labor, all of this is different. If you are creating an AWS infrastructure in a particular location, you need to have people who would uh, protect or provide security for that availability zone that will include labor costs. So the economics of a particular geographical region obviously plays a part into how costly uh, it is to run services or run data centers or availability zone in a particular region. So uh, this is a wrong answer. Okay, let's see what else we can cross out. So option C, it says AWS offers discount for Amazon EC2 instance that remain idle for more than one week. No, discounts does not exist for idle instances. It is your duty to make sure that uh, you put auto scaling or on-demand scaling, etc., in place. Uh, 
if in case your load is fluctuating, if you make a mistake of configuring, uh, say, 10 EC2 instance, whereas you're going to need at some point in time two and during the peak of the traffic 10, you will always pay for 10 services if you're not put any auto scaling. So Amazon doesn't do this. If you are using services, you have to pay for it. Whether they are idle or doing job doesn't make any difference. So that's wrong. So we rule that out. Option D, AWS does not charge for data sent from AWS cloud to internet. Nope, we have, we have done this uh, earlier as well. Uh, data coming into cloud is free. Data going out to the public internet is, is not free. So it's an incorrect option. That rules out option A, C, D, and we are left with option B and option E. Now let's analyze these options. Option B says AWS enables capacity to be adjusted on demand. Yes, perfect. Uh, scalability is the key factor about AWS services. You can dynamically scale your computing resources up and down based on your needs. This means you only pay for the resources you actually use in case you are using the scalability feature. This avoids, uh, you know, wasting of infrastructure and you don't pay unnecessarily cost. So this is a correct benefit. And option E, AWS eliminates many of the costs of building, maintaining on-premise data center. Perfect. Uh, if you are using AWS resources, customers don't have to manage and maintain and build their own data centers. And that's one of the biggest advantage, uh, probably the first, very first advantage of uh, using AWS cloud computing services. And both of these, these are the two ways, uh, you know, businesses reduces costs. So that's our answer. Option B and option E is the answer for this particular question. I would like to bring your attention to six advantages of cloud computing. You can see the options that we looked at, which is around spending money and running maintaining the data center and stop guessing the capacity. Those were what uh, we selected in the previous question. That's it on this question. Let's move on to the next question. Question number 109, a company wants to grant users in one AWS account access to resources in another AWS account. The user do not currently have permission to access the resources, which AWS service will meet this requirement. So the problem definition for this question is we need to give access for a particular user in an account to the resources in another account. Now let's look at what options we have. I'm group and I'm tag option A and option C. Both are primarily used for managing permission within a single AWS account. They are not used cross account. Uh, so this won't enable a cross account access. So both the options we rule out for that reason. Option D, I'm access analyzer. It's an audit tool. You can use this tool to understand uh, and, you know, audit and analyze the IAM policies and identify if there is any potential security risk. It doesn't grant access itself. So it's a tool for analyzing access, not granting access. So with that, we are left with our answer. Option B, I am role. It's specifically designed for granting temporary access. It can work from, you know, it can grant access from user on one account to assume a role in another account and allowing them to access resources based on the permission granted on the roles policy. So you can assume a role in another account using I'm roles. That's the answer for this particular scenario. Answer B. That's it on this question. Let's move on to the next question. Question number 10, which task is responsibility of AWS when using AWS services? So this is a question on shared responsibility model. We have done this uh, many times. Security of the cloud is AWS responsibility. Security in the cloud is a responsibility of the customer. Any configuration will be customer's responsibility. So if you look at uh, then options based on that, management of IAM user permissions, yeah, it's a customer responsibility. Customers are responsible for managing user access and permission. You decide who in your organization uh, and your company has access to certain uh, servers and locations, and that's all done through IAM. AWS doesn't decide. AWS gives you the resources, then your administrator, your operational staff will decide based on your policies, whom to give access and to what role the access will be given to. So option A is gone. That's a customer responsibility. Option B, creation of security group rules for outbound access. Again, this is part of a configuration activity. Customers themselves will define the rule for controlling inbound and outbound traffic. So configuration is customer responsibility, not an AWS responsibility. So that's gone. We rule that out. And... We have two more now, but we'll jump over to the last one first. Uh, it's obvious to rule out. Application of Amazon EC2 operating system patches. Patches, management of patches is a customer responsibility. So that leaves us with option C, management of physical and environmental control. We all know as a customer, you do not have access to AWS data centers, availability zones. You don't even know where those are, where your servers are within a particular data center. And you do not have access. You do not uh, provide security to these uh, data centers. So maintenance of physical and environmental control is AWS responsibility. And that it comes under 
security of the cloud. Cloud is all of these data centers and, and availability zones and AWS will obviously maintain it. And that's the answer for this question. Option C is the answer for question number 110. And I believe that was the last question in this episode. That brings us to the end of this episode. I will see you in the next episode of this series soon. If you like the content and want to get notified when I release the next episode of this series, then please subscribe to this channel. This is Exam Tricks and Tips. You're watching AWS Cloud Practitioner Series. See you in the next episode. Thanks for watching.